following program is brought to you by your friends at Podcast One. When it comes to your health, brushing your teeth is one of the most important parts of your day. Quip knows that. They've combined dentistry and design to make a better electric toothbrush. Quip is the new electric toothbrush that packs just the right amount of vibrations into a slimmer design. Plus, it's only a fraction of the cost of the bulkier traditional electric toothbrushes. The guiding pulses that alert you when to switch sides makes brushing the right amount a much easier task. Quip has helped me with one of my longtime toothbrush debacles. Where do I put my toothbrush when I'm finished? The bulky electric toothbrushes of the past didn't fit into the slots in my toothbrush container, but Quip's slimmer design has solved that problem. Plus, it also comes with a mount that suctions right to your mirror and doubles as a travel cover. Hygiene and convenience, all in one. Quip subscription plan refreshes your brush on a dentist-recommended schedule, delivering new brush heads every three months for just $5, including free shipping worldwide. Quip is backed by a network of over 10,000 dental professionals. And not to brag, but most toothbrushes don't get named one of Time Magazine's best inventions of the year. But Quip did. Find out for yourself why Quip is all the rage in improving your dental care. Quip starts at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash coldcase right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash coldcase. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash coldcase. Just a quick warning. Some of the interviews in this episode contain mature language. What I did is I took my chair, I put it right close to his so our knees were almost touching. And when they brought him in the room, you could see the fire in his eyes, their eyes of anger. I don't know what set him off, but he, he screamed at me, you want it? You f***ing want it? Get your tape recorder out. It was early October 1993, and in Michigan, that meant bow hunting season. 33-year-old Charles Murray was an avid hunter. A rifle had been his weapon of choice up to that point. But that year, he decided to venture into bow hunting. Excited to try out his new bow and this new sport, Charles left his home in Pontiac, which is just outside of Detroit. He headed up to the northern part of the state for the very first day of bow hunting season. A few days went by, and Charles didn't come home. Then, a few more days than a week. Until finally, Charles' mother, Sandy, decided something must be wrong. So she filed a missing persons report, got in her car, and headed north in search of her son. The hunt for the hunter was on. From A&E, this is Cold Case Files, the podcast. I'm Brooke, and this story, adapted from a classic episode of Cold Case Files, is told by the amazing Bill Curtis. He loved to go deer hunting, uh, rifle season, and he'd never uh, ventured into bow hunting until that, that year that had been his first time. Sandy Murray is worried about her son, 33-year-old Charles. And that's when I bought him the bow. Charles Murray had traveled up to northern Michigan for the first day of bow hunting season. That was more than a week ago. On a weekend, I know can go by, but a whole week, and, and, and then him not showing up at work, and that wasn't like him. And I thought, well, something's wrong. That evening, Sandy Murray contacts authorities. Then she gets into her car and heads north. A bird hit my window. You know, it's this old superstition, and I thought, it's a bad sign. And I thought, no. No, don't let it happen. But I knew it did. I knew something was a foul. I overheard some radio traffic uh, that the state police had on the air. Uh, something about they were with the family and the mother and the brother. And I heard something about a missing hunter. Theo Helms responds to the radio call. He meets Sandy and Matthew Murray, Charles Murray's half-brother. 
And I found out that the brother had actually been into this hunting area with him. And in talking to him, I said, well, if, if you went with me in my car, could you find that area where he normally punts? And he said, yeah, I think so. Helms and Matthew drive around and around before Matthew finally settles on an area he says looks familiar. This area is um, northeast of the intersection of Bissonette Road and M65. I guess the uh, address here would probably be Glenny. It was odd to me that he couldn't direct me right to the spot. I had the distinct feeling that he was, he wanted me to find his brother, but he was being evasive enough to make me think, well, he doesn't really uh, want me to know that he knows where exactly it is. Following a trail 600 feet into the woods, Helms stumbles upon a corpse. It's the body of Charles Murray. He had a perfectly round hole in his uh, forehead, and there's only one way a hole could get there. Uh, it looked like a bullet hole. Helms walks through the woods, back to where the dead man's brother, Matthew, waits. He didn't even ask me if he was dead or not. He just went down to one knee like this, and he said, he just shook his head, and he said, don't let mom and dad see him. So he didn't even question me, is he all right? Is he OK? And so it was a strange behavior. Helms' suspicions are relayed to the Michigan State Police, who take a hard look at Matthew Murray. Matthew, however, has a solid alibi, passes a polygraph, and is cleared as a suspect. Meanwhile, detectives canvass the area and happen upon a hunter named Daniel Fair. Uh, my father and I were hunting on opening morning. And shortly uh, as the morning progressed, we, I heard three loud gunshots. Um, it, it didn't happen very far away. We knew it, it would startle the game. And the hunting wouldn't be any good that morning. Um, so we started to pack up and leave. As father and son drive down the road, they are approached by someone who looks out of place in these woods. They slow down to get a better look. Well, he was large. Uh, he had a, a leather um, um, sleeveless vest on at the time, real bushy hair. Uh, he kind of hawked down and, and kind of gazed into the, uh, the window of the car, like looking at me like this, trying to spook us or scare us. And it worked. We were. I was intimidated at the time. And uh, he just looked out of place. That's not what you find on opening day of bow season. That's just not the type of character of a person that would be out there in the woods. The following day, Fair hears about the bow hunter shot in the head and calls police. This is a sketch of the, of the man that I saw opening day bow season in Oscoda, standing on the side of Biznet Road. The sketch is distributed among law enforcement, but fails to generate a suspect. In time, the image fades, and the case of the bow hunter goes cold. I love the woods. I'm in the woods a lot. I love to hike. I hike all over, um, but I'm not a hunter. Detective Sergeant Robert Bronco Lesneski works for the Michigan State Police. I have nothing against hunters, but I'm, I'm not a hunter. While he may not be a hunter in the traditional sense, Bronco knows how to stalk a criminal. Ten years after Charles Murray was shot and killed, Bronco picks up the old file and begins to work. I was convinced that there was somebody out there that knew something, you know, someone somewhere knew something. So I used the media a lot, and I thought, what better way than to call up the TV stations and, and the bigger newspapers and say, hey, I need your help. Greg Potts is a sergeant in nearby Bay County when he sees news reports on the bow hunter and calls in. I felt that uh, a guy by the name of Ronald Brown had been the person that had murdered his bow hunter out there. In 1993, Potts helped Ty Brown, a convicted killer recently out on parole, to a murder in a neighboring county. That murder took place the same day Charles Murray's body was found. In my mind, he's a serial killer that got out for about three months or two months, whatever he was out for, and, you know, committed two murders. And so that's what kind of sparked a chain of events for that investigation. That's huge. That's monumental. I mean, it's like, this has got to be my guy. 
Bronco's first step, compare Ron Brown's mugshot to a sketch of his murder suspect created in 1993. Um, and when I saw that, I'm like, oh my goodness, I couldn't believe it, just couldn't believe it. And then I went, took it one step further and I took a, I got on the Michigan Department of Corrections website and uh, got a better picture of Mr. Brown and it's just amazing. The detective believes Brown to be his killer. To get the suspect talking, however, Bronco must go one step beyond the normal call of duty. The advice, metaphorically speaking, you know, look at it as a love relationship and you start playing hard to get. How to play hard to get with a serial killer and why, after the break. If you're like me, you want to eat well, but don't have time to find recipes, plan meals, or venture out into the cold to go grocery shopping. Thanks to Green Chef, what's for dinner is an open and shut case. Green Chef delivers gourmet meal kits with everything needed to cook delicious meals at home. It's also super convenient. Each box includes all the ingredients for organic and easy recipes that anyone can cook. Plus, the ingredients come pre-portioned and already mostly prepped, saving me even more time. It only takes a few minutes to sign up, and because you're the best listeners ever, you can get $40 off by going to greenchef.us slash coldcase today. Green Chef is also the first USDA-certified organic meal kit company, and they strive to deliver 90% or more organic ingredients in their meal kits. I'm so thankful I always know what I'm getting with Green Chef. Plus, they have options for everyone. Keto, gluten-free, vegan, and more specialty menu options, which was especially helpful when my mom came to visit last week. My mom has a gluten allergy, and I'm always afraid, despite my efforts, that I'll somehow make her sick. But Green Chef's gluten-free menu selections made it the most relaxing visit yet. Plus, the food was delicious. We had the barbecue beef mini loaves, and the Vietnamese shrimp bowl. Green Chef's recipes are designed by expert chefs, so you can enjoy the restaurant experience right at home. Sign up today and pick a meal plan that's made for you. Go to greenchef.us slash coldcase and get $40 off your first meal kit. Cold Case Files, the podcast, is brought to you by Jergens Wet Skin Moisturizer. Now you can lotion up on wet skin. It absorbs like that for softness all day. Jergens, let your beautiful shine. Podcast One and Sound of Success present Oh My, a celebration of Dick Enberg, a special Sound of Success episode commemorating one of the greatest sportscasters of all time. Hosted by Rich Eisen and Susie Schuster with interviews and stories from Vin Scully, Jim Nance, Bill Walton, Dan Patrick, Billie Jean King, Steve Kerr, and more. Find Oh My, a celebration of Dick Enberg on PodcastOneSports.com and the Podcast One app. If you've never heard a shotgun blast, it is loud. A 12-gauge shotgun measures at 140 decibels. That's louder than a jackhammer, louder than a rock concert, and even louder than a jet engine at a distance of 100 feet. You wouldn't expect a shotgun blast ringing out through the quiet woods to go unnoticed, especially on the first day of bow hunting season. Those woods were filled with hunters, most of whom were sporting much quieter weapons. So the sound of a shotgun would really stand out. And yet, only two people, a father and a son, heard or saw anything useful to police. They were able to produce a sketch for the police of a suspicious person, but the sketch didn't lead to a suspect. Ten years later, Detective Sergeant Robert Bronco Lesneski thinks he may have found the person in the sketch, a convicted killer, and possible serial killer, named Ronald Brown. Brown had been connected to another murder, also in 1993, on the same day Charles Murray's body was found. He was already in prison and unmotivated to talk. So in order to get a confession, Bronco had to think outside the box. From a perpetrator's perspective, it's probably a target-rich area. Detective Robert Bronco Lesneski is a hunter of sorts. I think it probably was looked at as a serial killer's playground, without a doubt. Bronco's latest target, 
a twice convicted killer named Ron Brown. He's a bad dude. He's a scary dude and he's a bad dude. Um, he's psychotic. He's the kind of guy that you certainly would not want to cross paths with anywhere. Bronco believes Brown killed 33-year-old Charles Murray 10 years earlier. So I'm putting together this circumstantial case, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm cooking it. You know, I'm, I got it going. Bronco knows he needs more, a lot more. What it would need to put the case over the top would clearly be a, a confession. Ideally, I think most old, old cases, uh, that's what it takes. Ron Brown is serving a life sentence at the Freeland Correctional Facility. Bronco pays him a visit. We'd start off that he'd be really contentious, almost like he'd want to fight. He just, you know, just despised me. And then as time progressed, you know, he would accept me and we'd start talking. And by the time I left, we were shaking hands. I'm breaking the ice with this guy a little bit. I know I'm making some headway with him. Bronco has taken the first critical step, establishing a rapport with the suspect. The next step, let the convicted murderer talk about how he kills. He'd make statements like, well, shotguns are my weapon of choice. You can easily make a kill from a long distance off. And, quote, I generally just leave the body there anyway, unquote. So, I mean, he's given me all this information that is consistent with what happened to this bow hunter. Brown is giving up a lot of information, none of which gets Detective Bronco Lesneski any closer to a confession. Keep in mind, I'm looking at a guy that's been twice convicted of murder who's doing natural life in the prison. What incentive is, is there for him to, to confess to me? Bronco is going to need some help and turns to a couple of experts in the human psyche. Bronco, I think, was looking for insight as to what kind of made this individual tick. Doctors Robert Wolford and Michael Comer are psychologists for the Michigan State Police and represent a last best hope for Bronco. I felt like I was kind of stymied in the investigation. Without a doubt, I felt that the focus uh, was at that point with Ron Brown, and, and uh, I was looking for some kind of a way that I could... Uh, maneuver myself a little bit closer to him to get him to talk to me. The doctors begin by reviewing Brown's criminal history, his conversations with Bronco, and conversations with his own family. Dr. Wolford, I think you said, you know, get me some intelligence information on this yeah. guy. And, and what I ended up doing was, uh, unbeknownst to him, I was copying phone conversations between he and his family from, from his prison cell. I love you. I love you too. And I'm sorry to put everything on you, but... Where else can you go, right? In analyzing those tapes and just basically listening to those tapes, what came through very strongly was the need for Mr. Brown to make sure that family members and I suspect even other individuals thought that he was uh, a very important person. I needed someone I could talk to outside, you know? But don't lose faith in me. I don't, I don't. According to the doctors, Mother Brown wasn't the only one making her son feel important. So was Bronco. He was really feeling superior uh, to Bronco because Bronco would come to visit him. He would tease Bronco with part of the story, but not give, him, give Bronco enough to get a conviction or a confession. And so Mr. Brown could walk away saying, I'm beating the cop. Control is something Ron Brown craves, and the convicted killer doesn't have many people on such a short leash. I can remember you guys saying, hey, listen, Bronco, the most important person in his life is his mother. And I can remember sitting in this room when you said, and the second most important person in his life may be you. And, and I mean, I was completely taken back by it. It just didn't seem right to me at the time. You were giving him lots and lots of attention, which he craved because he thought he was really uh, very hot stuff. But he didn't have to give anything up mm -hmm. uh, to get that attention. To turn this around and put Bronco back in control, the doctors take a page from the book of romance. I think the phrase Bob used was, you need to play hard to get. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You gotta start playing hard to get. That's yeah. exactly it, yeah. The psychologists tell Bronco to stop the visits to Brown, stop the phone calls, stop the correspondence, 
and wait. We've used as kind of metaphorically is he establishes an extremely close, almost like a love type relationship. That's how important uh, he was to this individual. And then he just disappears out of the picture. He's gone. It's like somebody being involved with a partner for a year or so, building a relationship, and then all of a sudden they don't call him anymore. The doctors believe Ron Brown might actually offer up a confession to Charles Murray's murder all in the hopes of winning Bronco back. And I can remember sitting in this room when we're talking about it, and they're actually, we're, they, my colleagues are laughing at me, you know, like, well, that's crazy, you know. But that's what I did. He's sending me letters, and he's telling the inspector that he wants to talk to me. On June 1st, Bronco cuts off all communication with Brown. The convict takes it hard. I will talk to you without a lawyer. I have nothing to hide. I waive all my rights. I mean, it was really hard to be disciplined and not go down there and talk to him. Bronco resists the urge. A month later, his patience pays off. Ron Brown sends a letter to the prosecutor that says, this damn detective won't come and talk to me. Get an attorney down here, I want to confess. And when the prosecutor called me at home and told me that, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just can't believe it. On July 20th, 2004, Bronco prepares to break the silence and talk with Ron Brown. I set Ron Brown's chair right here in this exact location, and I had his head against the back of the control center. I wanted him focused on me the whole time, so putting his head at the back of this control center, he's not watching people, he's not seeing any movement, nothing at all. It's just he and I in this great big room. And what I did is I took my chair and I put it right close to his so our knees were almost touching, was just like this. And when they brought him in the room, if you could see the fire in his eyes, he's got some deep set eyes anyway, and they're just their eyes of anger. And he's coming in and he's walking and his arms are tight and he's pulling up. He's got a belly band attached to the irons on his hands and he's pulling up on it so hard that I can see it and it's cutting the circulation off in his arms. I mean, he is so mad that I can just see it. Brown is chained, cuffed, and Bronco hopes, ready to talk. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen right here and now. It's either going to happen, or our relationship's going to be severed, and I could potentially lose any relationship that I ever had with him for later on down the road in the future. So it, it, for me, it was like, it's like do or die. I don't know what set him off, and I, I, I really don't know what it was, but he, he screamed at me, you want it? You f***ing want it? Get your tape recorder out. Well, now my heart is beating so hard that I'm thinking my pen's gonna pop out of my chest and hit me in the eye. I mean, I was, it was just, I was really nervous. You know what this is about, correct? Yes. This is about a bull hunter that was shot out of a tree blind. Yep. You're telling me that you want to confess to that? Yep. He was ready, without a doubt. You know, he was just so matter of fact. I mean, he had a story to tell. And I wasn't in charge. He was in charge. That's what he wanted me to know. How did you do that, Ron? He got shot three times, about 50 yards away. Three times with a 12 gauge double buck shells. And he fell out of the tree. What were you doing up in that area in the first place? Just driving around looking for someone to shoot. Why did you shoot him? For no reason, just shot him. You shot him for no reason? That's it. He was there, so I shot him. Uh, that's scary. He is a scary man. Ron Brown pleads guilty to manslaughter and gets 20 to 30 years for the murder of Charles Murray. For Bronco, the case has earned him quite the reputation. I look back at it now and I take some heat for it and, uh, you know, big bad Bronco and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, love of relationship with inmate Brown. But to this seasoned detective, it's just another role he needs to play to get the job done. I mean, police officers wear the hat of a, of a social worker. They wear the hat of a clergy person. They wear the hat of a peacekeeper. They wear the hat of a policeman, you know, and if I got to wear the hat of uh, uh, some estranged person from a relationship that was started out of prison because of a homicide, 
then you bet your bottom dollar I'm going to do it. At his trial, Ronald Brown admitted to shooting and killing Charles Murray, who was in a portable hunting blind at the time. Brown mentioned something about an altercation, but didn't elaborate further. Murray was shot three times with buckshot from 50 yards away, so any kind of close-range altercation seems unlikely. What seems more likely is what Brown himself said during his confession, that he was driving around looking for someone to shoot. It's hard to make sense of any murder, but the seemingly random nature of this one makes it especially scary and difficult to process. And for Charles Murray's family, it's understandable that they feel like the system has let them down. After all, Ronald Brown's guilty plea for manslaughter in the case of Charles Murray amounted to his third murder conviction, the first of which came in 1977, and his early release in September of 1993 was the only thing that allowed him to be in the same vicinity as Charles Murray. Brown had not even been free for two weeks before he killed again. Murray's family was also disappointed with the charge of manslaughter, which implies there was no intent. They can take some solace, though, in knowing that Brown's second murder conviction, which he was convicted of in 1994, carried a life sentence. A life sentence which Brown is still currently carrying out in a Michigan prison. Cold Case Files, the podcast, is hosted by Brooke Giddings. Produced by McKamey Lynn, Scott Brody, and Steve Delamater. Our executive producer is Ted Butler. We're distributed by Podcast One. The Cold Case Files TV series was produced by Curtis Productions and hosted by Bill Curtis. Check out more Cold Case Files at AETV.com and by downloading the A&E app. Charges in Milwaukee jail death, Obama's portraits. I'm Tim McGuire with an AP News Minute. The Milwaukee County Jail Commander, a supervisor, and a deputy face criminal charges for their role in the 2016 dehydration death of an inmate who spent a week without water. Milwaukee County District Attorney John Chisholm. We made the determination that these three individuals were responsible um, for the actions surrounding Mr. Thomas's death. Investigation found Terrell Thomas had water to his cell shut off as a punishment for flooding it with a mattress in April 2016. Supervisor and deputy face neglect charges. The commander is charged with misconduct. The official portrait of both former President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama were unveiled today at the National Portrait Gallery. Obama jokes that he tried to get artist Kehinde Wiley to put less gray in his hair and smaller ears. Kehinde's artistic integrity would not allow